The English county of Greater Manchester is home to over 2 million people. Located in the northwest, it is the third most populous county in the UK, after Greater London and the West Midlands. According to the GMP, Greater Manchester Police, around 200,000 reports of crimes are filed every year, and although homicides make up a relatively small proportion of the total number, many of those most violent offences remain unsolved. In today's episode, we aim to shed light on a few of these lesser-known stories as we explore four spine-chilling unsolved cases from Greater Manchester, England. Lisa Hessian On December 8, 1984, the body of Lisa Jane Hessian was discovered a mere 200 yards from her home in an alleyway. Lisa, a confident 14-year-old, had been a cross-country runner and a talented gymnast. Her schoolmates, shocked by the news, collected money and had a cherry tree planted on the school's grounds, accompanied by a plaque bearing her name, hoping that one day soon they would see justice. But almost 40 years later, her case is still unsolved. Lisa was an outgoing and popular student at Bedford High in the town of Lee, who was raised by her mother, Christine, and her grandmother, Ellen. On December 8th, the day that Lisa was killed, she attended a house party on Lee Road with her boyfriend, Craig Newell, and her friends. She was given permission to go to the party with the strict instruction that she would return home by 10.30 p.m. If she could be trusted with her curfew, she would be allowed to attend the school's disco a few nights later. At 10.15 that night, Lisa began to say her goodbyes. On her route home, she walked through the town centre and onto St. Helens Road before turning onto Buck Street. She was just one minute's walk from her home, but she never made it back. Five minutes before midnight, a father and son who were out walking their dog discovered Lisa's body in an alley behind Rugby Road. Christine who had just notified the police about her daughter's failure to come home, had passed by the entrance to the alleyway where her daughter's body was lying three times, unaware of the horror within. Just three days after Lisa's death, authorities revealed that three young women and girls had been victims of sex attacks just months before the murder. In August 1984, the first in a string of women reporting these kinds of attacks came forward. 20-year-old medical records officer Carol Gallagher had been on her way home in Rugby Road when a man, aged 18 to 20, wearing a red hat and a blue tracksuit, put a hand over her mouth and dragged her to the ground. Though he threatened her, Carol was able to talk her way out of the situation, as she had psychiatric training. After speaking with the man, she discovered that he couldn't get a girlfriend, and he even apologized for his actions. The second attack occurred on September 2nd, when a man exposed himself to a 16-year-old girl near Martha Lane and threatened to break her neck if she screamed. She was hit and pushed against a wall, but managed to knee her attacker in the groin, giving her a chance to run away. Then on September 7th, just one day before Lisa's death, a 17-year-old girl was walking along Central Avenue when a man appeared and exposed himself to her. He threatened to kill her if she made any noise and attempted to push her to the ground, but she managed to escape. A fifth attack would later be documented in May of 1985. One week after Lisa's death, a policewoman dressed in a similar fashion as the 14-year-old walked down the alleyway where her body had been found. Detectives were attempting to jog people's memories, a well-used police tactic at the time, but nothing much came of this. In January of 1985, investigators issued an EFIT of a 5'9", 20-year-old baby-faced man they wanted to speak to. The image was based on the descriptions given by Carol Gallagher and the teenagers who'd been attacked before Lisa's death, but the man was never identified. At the inquest in April of 1985, pathologist Jeffrey Garrett revealed that Lisa's demise had been caused by pressure on her neck, consistent with her t-shirt being tightened around her throat. 
Her skirt had been pushed up to her waist, and her underwear had been torn. It is believed that while the culprit covered Lisa's mouth with one hand, he pulled her t-shirt tight with the other. The coroner concluded that although it was an unlawful killing, the perpetrator may not have intended to kill Lisa. Although a Crime Watch appeal was issued, no concrete leads emerged in the case. It lay dormant for several decades until 2011, when authorities examined a partial DNA sample recovered from the crime scene and began swabbing men in the Lee and Wigan areas, looking for a match. Unfortunately, there were no hits. In almost 40 years, only one person has ever been arrested in the case. He was questioned in the days following Lisa's death and was released on bail. He was never charged in connection with the case and has subsequently died. Sadly, Lisa's mother passed away in 2016 with no answers and no justice. A £50,000 reward is available for information leading to the identity and conviction of the perpetrator. Authorities have noted their belief that the attacker was local, knew the area well, and was aware that the alleyway was a more private and secluded area to carry out his crime. Dorothy Layden On April 24th, 1971, 17-year-old Dorothy Layden spent her evening in the front row of a concert by Jimmy Ruffin at the Golden Garter Nightclub in Wythenshaw. Dorothy, an avid Motown fan, was even able to catch a towel Ruffin had thrown to the audience after wiping it across his brow. She left the concert on a post-gig high, happy with how things had panned out. After the excitement was over, though, it was time to get home. The teenager and her friends piled into a cab, but she got out alone at Piccadilly Gardens bus station around 2.30 a.m. She wanted to walk the rest of the way home to save herself some money. Dorothy's body was discovered later that morning on Rochdale Road in Collyhurst. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death with a brick. The towel from the concert, a memento from the night she should have been able to look back on fondly, was still in her bag. For decades, Trevor Hardy, dubbed the Beast of Manchester, was suspected of being responsible for her death. Hardy had taken the lives of three other teenagers, Sharon Mossoff, Wanda Scala, and Leslie Stewart. He was given life behind bars in 1977, having been convicted of all three killings. Notably, he had attacked Wanda Scala with a brick. At the time of Dorothy's death, there was no evidence tying Hardy to the case, and leads soon dried up. In 2004, though, Dorothy's family asked the police to re-examine the case. They hoped that with new forensic techniques and technologies, they would finally be able to get some answers. And though the killer is still at large, what they did find is that Trevor Hardy was not, in fact, responsible for Dorothy's death. DNA evidence pulled from the crime scene at the time was not a match to the Beast of Manchester, although it put the investigation firmly back at square one. But there was some relief that this persisting theory had finally been put to rest once and for all. In 2016, BBC's Crime Watch program ran a segment on the case, including a reconstruction of the teenager's last known movements. Detective Sergeant Julie Adams, who is part of the cold case unit, noted that a surprising amount of information had come in following the show's airing, stating, we have had a really positive response. We received 20 pieces of information which I have reviewed. We've come up with two names that are very, very exciting to us, and that we are going to continue to do some research on. However, if there have been any developments in the case since, they have not been made public, and Dorothy's case remains unsolved. Elsa Hannaway 37-year-old Elsa Hannaway spent the evening of October 29th, 1987, dancing. A vibrant woman full of life, Elsa had moved to the UK after leaving her home on the island of St. Vincent in the West Indies at the age of 16. On the evening of the 29th, she decided to get a brief respite from her children and spend some time with herself and her friends, dancing and socializing at the West Indiana Sports and Social Club before visiting the big western pub for a few more drinks. Elsa left the pub in the company of a man, who later told the inquest that he felt she was worse for wear. She was next seen on Quinny Crescent, knocking on doors in an attempt to find a party. Shortly afterwards, though, she returned to the sports and social club before leaving at 1.15am. At around 2.45am, 
an eyewitness saw a woman resembling Elsa arguing with a black man with dreadlocks. The witness, who was exiting a taxi, recalled, he grabbed her from behind and put his arms round her and pinned her arms to the side. The witness began to walk away, but looked back in time to see the woman on her hands and knees, saying, oh my god, as the man stood over her. Not long after this, Elsa was kicked unconscious and dragged 100 yards into Whitworth Park in Rushholme. She was then sexually assaulted and beaten to such a violent extent that she lost a tooth, suffered brain damage, and was dealt severe internal injuries. Her body was left nude and her clothing had been left behind at the scene, along with a Seconda watch which investigators soon discovered was not Elsa's, indicating it may have belonged to her killer and possibly came off in the struggle. The man with the dreadlocks was seen running from the park at 3.10 a.m. Elsa's body was found around five hours after her death by a jogger passing through. In the following days, authorities conducted house-to-house -house inquiries and began to put together a picture of Elsa's last known movements. But frustratingly, nothing more has come of the identity of the man seen with the mother of five that night. The public had very little information to offer, and in the years since, there has been allegations that policing at the time was heavily racist and saw officers accused of harassment, abuse, and brutality of families in the area during the 1980s. For this reason, many were afraid to speak with police officers, which possibly hampered the investigation. Though the initial investigation involved 125 detectives, it was essentially put aside after a few years, as authorities ran out of leads to investigate. Joanne Hannaway, Elsa's eldest daughter, who was 17 at the time of her death, felt like her mother's case was forgotten. In 2016, Elsa's case was re-examined. Investigators hoped, like Dorothy Layden's family did, that new forensic evidence could be found which would help them uncover her killer's identity. But as it stands, Elsa's case is still unsolved. Evelyn Jackson Evelyn Jackson was a 97-year-old great-grandmother living in Longsight when she was brutally beaten by a home intruder on November 28, 2003. That day, Evelyn had been home alone when her doorbell rang. When she answered it, she was greeted by a man who claimed he was looking for her great-granddaughter. Then Evelyn's jaw and hip were smashed as the person at the door punched the elderly woman to the ground before kicking her. The perpetrator made off with Evelyn's savings, which she had planned on using to buy Christmas presents that year, and she was left traumatized and severely injured on the floor. Evelyn only had one arm and was a wheelchair user, as well as being partially deaf. She had survived cancer, a heart attack, and TB over the course of her life, and had been living alone as a perfectly capable elderly woman under caretaker supervision. The attack was unlike anything the local community had seen, with her family labeling the culprit as a coward. Evelyn was discovered shortly after the incident by a neighbor and rushed from her home in Bickerdyke Court to the Manchester Royal Infirmary, where she was found to be badly beaten and bruised, having suffered a broken jaw and hip. She died from her injuries 12 days later on December 10th. Before long, word spread about the horrific assault she had endured, and one local offered up a £200 reward for anyone who knew the identity of the attacker. There was some speculation that the perpetrator was local and known to young people in the area, but nobody wanted to come forward and speak with the police. A 14-year-old boy was arrested shortly after the incident, but was released on police bail pending inquiries. The investigation into Evelyn's death, however, stalled shortly after it began. In 2016, the case was looked at again, and a fresh appeal for information was launched, though it appears to have garnered no significant leads. Evelyn's granddaughter, Diane Monks, recalled how horrified she was to see the brutality her grandmother had endured when she went to visit her in hospital, stating, I nearly passed out. She was covered in bruises. Her face was nearly completely black. I just don't understand how someone could have done that to my grandmother, a 97-year-old woman. Evelyn's loved ones described her as tough, funny, and always joking and laughing. Diane remembered, she's missed. She never stopped talking about getting her telegram from the Queen when she was 100. She was so excited. Tragically, Evelyn's attacker is still unidentified. If you have any information about the cases of Evelyn Jackson, Elsa Hannaway, Dorothy Layden, or Lisa Hessian, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously. 
at 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.